So, last time we're going to talk about something new this semester. It's kind of cool, it's a little sad for me. Um, beginning of your journey in computer science, at least in this class. But one of the things I want to do today, I know that we have an exam out, so obviously this content can't be on the exam. Uh, we have one more homework problem, uh, which I released earlier today, which you guys will have today and tomorrow to finish. So at some point, I think some of you are like, what am I doing here? Um, it's fine, um, you know, we do have participation points for today's lecture, a lot of you don't need them, but the goal, my goal today is actually uh, to sort of, um, you know, you, you've come this far, you guys have done great work this semester, we'll talk all about that on Wednesday, how much effort you've put in and, and the, the, the place that you've uh, reached, right, the amount of, you know, new skills that you now have. But part of my goal today is actually kind of to throw you back um, and push you back into the deep end um, where you can feel a little uncomfortable again because there is so much more to learn um, out there and I don't want you to feel too comfortable as, as you come out of here. There's still a lot to do. I also want you to be excited about the fact that there's so much more to learn and more to do um, in your future as a technologist, your future as a computer scientist, your future as a software developer. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about a new programming style. We've seen how to write imperative code this semester. We've seen how to write object-oriented code. We've seen how to write recursive code. Uh, but what we're going to look at today is how to write functional Java. And this is actually really interesting. It's really cool. It's a programming style that's becoming more popular, supported in a wide variety of programming languages. And there's limited support for this in Java. So I'm going to kind of walk you through it. We're going to start with an argument about why we're going to do this. And then we'll look at some examples sort of incrementally which will, along the way, introduce us to some new Java features that were just introduced in some of the latest versions of Java. So this is actually really exciting, very new stuff. Okay, so let's get started. So again, this semester, what we've done over the past, you know, three, four months, 15 weeks, is we've introduced you to imperative programming. We've shown you how to directly tell a computer how to solve a problem using a series of decisions that the computer might make, repeated uh, execution, little bits of math, um, you know, writing functions and things like this. So, so we've done this. Uh, you guys have had a lot of practice with this this semester. We've also talked about how to design objects, uh, both to, you know, encapsulate data, but also to provide uh, behavior, to sort of co-locate data and algorithms together within the same class. We, we've showed you how to do that, and you've had a lot of practice with that as well. Um, over the past month or so, you started getting some practice for writing recursive um, programs. This was maybe one of the first places where things started to get a little weird, right? It started to feel a little uncomfortable. You weren't always sure, sure at first why your code worked. Some of the better entries in our meme competition are about that. Um, but, you know, so, but you've given, you've, you've seen some of this. You, you've seen this, you've had some practice with it. So today, what I want to do is take you again a step beyond Java. We're actually going to stay inside of Java itself, but we're going to look at some things in Java that you haven't seen before that point the way to what's next for you uh, in your future as a technologist and as a computer scientist. So here's the thing, particularly for you that are, those of you that are new to this. Most programmers, most computer scientists who work, who build things, know and have to know several different programming languages. Um, there's usually one or two that are their kind of go-to language where if you give them a project and you don't have any constraints, that's what they'll use. But there's a lot of times when there are constraints for a project. So for example, I like writing JavaScript, but if I'm going to write an Android app, I don't necessarily get to do that because the Android platform requires that I write code in Java or in Kotlin. So I have to use one of those languages. In other cases, there are certain languages that are better for solving certain types of problems. Um, so. Now, you know, the, the debate about what languages to learn is also clouded by the fact that a lot of different languages are, are what we refer to as multi-paradigm. They allow you to use multiple different styles. So again, we've seen this in Java. Java has a very strong object-oriented core, but we can still write recursive code in Java. We can still write functional code in Java. We're going to do that today. Um, so languages like Python, JavaScript, you know, Kotlin, a, a lot of languages that get a lot of use out there in the world allow you to program in a variety of different styles, even while continuing to use the same language. C++ is certainly one of these languages that's sort of famous for this. Um, sometimes solving the problem starts by choosing the right language. There's, so again, there are certain things that if you try to build them in the wrong language, you will become very frustrated. Do not try to build, you know, any sort of web backend in C++, okay? 
Not that it's impossible, it's possible, but it's not the right way to do it. There are other languages that have better support for building that particular type of thing. And again, you know, there are certain things that if you tried to build them in a language other than C++, you would be, you would be very frustrated. And again, so a lot of the languages in use today support a lot of different programming styles and paradigms. So I can, you know, I can write imperative code in Python. I can write functional code in Python. I can write object-oriented code in Python as well. Um, and that's true for JavaScript. That's also true for Java. Again, as we're going to see in a minute. And there's, you know, there, there are raging debates online about which one of these to use. You can find a lot of people that have strong opinions about this um, and engage with them and sort of get a sense of what they have to say. Um, but, you know, you, you guys are... You guys have arrived here at a very exciting time, I think, because there's really a lot of exciting development in this space going on. So if you guys go out right now, you're going to find dozens of languages available for you to use that have different idioms, that have different ideas about how to solve problems. Um, and exposure to that variety is actually a really good thing, particularly when you're starting off as a computer scientist and a software developer, seeing multiple ways to solve problems and being able to train your brain to think about things differently. So for the next couple of slides, I'm, I'm, I'm also going to make this argument. And th th I, I want to point this out to you mainly because um, you're going to feel uncomfortable once you start actually trying to do this. Once you try to pick up a new language, you're going to feel uncomfortable. And I'm going to try to explain to you why that is and give you a sense of why you might actually actively seek out that discomfort. How many, know who, how many people know who Paul Graham is? OK, that, that's, a, that's a depressingly small number. How many people have heard of Y Combinator? Okay, maybe a few more hands. Does anyone read Hacker News? Okay, maybe not enough of you. So um, Paul Graham is an is a incredibly famous Silicon Valley entrepreneur. He started some really famous companies himself, but for the past several decades, he's been working uh, with um, the probably the most famous Silicon Valley um, startup incubator, something called Y Combinator. So y Combinator gave birth to a bunch of companies that I'm sure you recognize and know the name of. Um, it's also spawned an enormous amount of innovation within the tech sector, right? So this is someone who's worth listening to. And this is an argument here. He has, he has, a, he has a blog, a very rarely updated one. Um, but this is part of a famous argument he made in a really actually fantastic post that I would encourage you to read about why they chose, he and a friend of his chose to use Lisp for a project, okay? So here's how the argument goes. So, the first part of it is that programming styles vary in power. So as you guys go forward, what you'll find is that sometimes if you approach a problem in the wrong way, it becomes very difficult to solve, whereas if you approach a problem in a different way, it becomes easier to solve. We saw that when we used recursion. So the problems that you guys solved using recursion, particularly on trees, are much harder to solve if you don't use recursion. Okay, so they're not impossible. You can solve them either way, but they're harder. Okay? So that's a place where a particular style of approaching a problem produces a solution that is much, much more elegant. Okay? In general, when you are solving a problem as a computer scientist, you want to pick the most powerful style available to you. This makes sense, right? Nobody would argue with this. Okay? Um, now, again, there are exceptions to this rule because there are constraints that might be imposed on the problem by the type of thing you're trying to build or whatever. But within the boundary of those constraints, you want to pick the approach, the style, the language, the environment, the library that's going to make the job as easy as possible. Again, this is like really somewhat uncontroversial at this point, okay? Here's where things get interesting. So you guys now know how to program some Java. If you go out and you look at another environment or another language or another tool for solving problems using code, if you find something that's less powerful than Java, it's going to feel familiar because you're going to understand it, but it's, you're going to see the limitations. You're going to be like, oh, in Java I can do this, and this language doesn't have that feature or something like that. So, right, so you'll be able to identify what's wrong with it. But that's only true when you're looking at languages that are less powerful than Java or styles of programming that might be less powerful than the styles of programming you've learned this semester. Here's what's important. So Paul Graham refers to this as looking up or down, sorry, up or down the power spectrum, right? So when you're looking down the power spectrum from something that you're familiar with to things that are less powerful than that thing, things look familiar. 
When you look up the power spectrum, however, at approaches and styles of programming that might be more powerful, that might actually allow you to solve problems easier, your initial reaction is going to be confusion. And sometimes you're gonna be like, what? You know, like, wait, hold on. Like, you know, that language doesn't even allow me to write a loop. Like, I can't program in that language, clearly. I know how to write loops, loops are great. I've solved a bunch of problems with loops. Um, again, your language doesn't have a loop? I, I'm not sure, it must, there must be something wrong with it, right? Um, that's how it's gonna feel, right? Um, and, and again, you're gonna scratch your heads, you're gonna be like, wait, I can't, this doesn't make any sense to me, right? Again, like, there are languages that don't essentially have no support for loops, right? People write really sophisticated, interesting code in those languages, but again, some of you have gotten used to writing loops, which is great, it's one tool to solve a problem, and when you encounter one of those languages, it's gonna be like, huh? You know, I mean, I can't believe anybody does anything with this. How do you solve a problem in this language where I can't even iterate over something? So here's a, here's a, here's a lightly uh, paraphrased quote from, from the article. So as long, if you think about a programmer, as long as she's looking down the power continuum, she knows she's looking down because she sees things that are less powerful but familiar. But when she looks up, she doesn't realize that she's looking up. All she sees are things that are unfamiliar. Um, and she might see things that she's not sure what to do with, right? Some of the things I'm gonna show you today, I think will bewilder and frighten you a little, but that's part of my goal, um, is to show you some of these new, new paradigms. All right, so, so again, let's think about how we got to this point. So we started off writing purely imperative code. That's what we did for about a month at the beginning of the semester. So you're going to essentially write, um, you know, you could, you could solve every problem that we solved all semester by writing one big function. You could solve all the MPs that we gave you this semester by writing one big function, just full of imperative code. That would be hard, and you would have a difficult time solving the problem that way because it's not the right approach. Then we gave you this new feature in Java. We introduced you to objects, and we showed you how you can use objects to model real-world entities as well as things within your code, and there's a nice clarity and cleanliness that comes with the ability to take things that belong together, two pieces of data that belong together, um, to add them as part of a single entity, and then to be able to write functions that also operate on that data. So that was kind of a nice thing. There were a lot of things that worked well with objects. When we got to trees, we started to realize, wait, actually iterating through a tree is hard. This is not something that we're prepared to do. Um, and what we realized is that recursive approaches, particularly on self-similar data structures like trees, lists, graphs, which you guys did for the last MP, um, work extremely well. And so we, we worked with those as well. So at this, you know, so again, it's, at some point, for some of you, some of these concepts might have been unfamiliar. Some of you might have not been familiar with objects or imperative programming even, or, you know, um, recursion. You saw these things, we practiced them together, they got more familiar over time. But initially, when we showed you how to solve problems using recursion, I think some of you were pretty skeptical. I was skeptical when I saw recursion for the first time, years and years ago. I was like, I don't think this is the right way to do this. Um, it turns out that it is, in a lot of cases. All right, but there's more up there, right? This is what I'm trying to point out. So we've been sort of slowly, you know, bringing you up the power continuum, but there is a lot more where that uh, came from. There's a lot more that, that you know, ab above and you know, again, my goal today is to point out if there's nothing you take away from this lecture other than one thing, which is that when you find something unfamiliar out there in the world, don't just write it off for that reason. Particularly if really smart people are using it to do cool stuff, then you know there's something to it. Okay, so let's uh, use an example that we're gonna kinda continue out through the rest of the class. It's gonna give us a chance to see some of the differences between how we approach these problems. So essentially I have some dogs, we're going back to our you know, favorite dog class. I have some dogs with some different attributes and I want to write a function that given a list of dogs, takes that list and produces a new list that's a smaller list that contains only the dogs that have some feature. Like maybe they're a certain age or they have a certain birthday or something like that. All right, so here's my example code. I'm creating a new array list here containing three dogs. These are dogs that some of the friend, my dog and some of his friends. Um, and, and then I have a, a date. So every one of them has an age and a birthday. The birthdays are made up, but that's a day of the year. 
and I want to, let's say I just want to figure out whose birthday is on a particular day of the year. So what's one way to approach this problem that you guys already know? Like if I gave you this question on a quiz, and I said, you know, return a list that only contains dogs that have, you know, a birthday that's equal to the day 100, how would you do it? What's the way to do it? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to create a new list here, right? So let's say I create a, a new list of dogs. Um, I'll call that filtered dogs, and this is going to be a new array list. I'll use the diamond operator get, to get the right type. That's initially empty. And then I just go through my list. All right, so I'm going to, I can use the enhanced for loop to go through an array list. That's pretty nice. And I say if dog.getBirthday is equal to today, then I'm going to add it to my new list. So I'll do filtered dogs dot, is it add? Well, we're about to find out, All right? Otherwise, I ignore it. And then at the end, I'll print off filtered dogs to see if I did the right thing here. Okay, that seems like it worked, right? Uh, let's change today to a different day. Um, so now I've got the two dogs that have that birthday. That's, I, I made that up, it's not true. If I use a birthday that's not, uh, that no dog has, then I have an empty list, okay? So this is how we've trained you to solve this problem. And it's particularly, it's totally fine, right? This is, a, this is one way to solve this problem. This is an imperative solution, right? But I wanna, I wanna show you some things about this that maybe are a little bit suboptimal. Right? Maybe there's some opportunities here for us to, to build something that's a little bit more powerful. So it's essentially one of the down, you know, uh, the drawbacks of imperative programming is it forces you to tell the computer exactly how to do this. So I've got to create the new array list, and then I've got to walk through, and I've got to check everything, and if it's right, I need to add it to the array list. So this, this is, isn't actually that much code, but, you know, on some level, it seems like this is kind of a common operation. I have a list, and I want to identify all the elements in the list that have some property, right? Um, it would be nice if instead of having to write this for loop 10,000 times in your career, you could find a way to just tell Java what you want, right? Tell, I, I, essentially what I want to be able to tell Java is, I want dogs with this birthday. That's all I should have to say. The rest of it should just happen sort of magically, right? And this is a style of programming that's sometimes referred to as declarative. You know, again, so these are styles. I want to make that very clear, too, right? When we talk about functional programming in this lecture, we're talking about a style of programming that differs from imperative programming in ways that I hope will become clear by the time we're done. These are not rules. It's simply a stylistic difference. So in declarative programming, instead of telling the computer how, I tell the computer what I want. Um, and I let it figure out how to actually do that for me. So essentially what I kind of want to be able to tell Java is, from this list, give me all the dogs that have this property. I need to, to be able to express what the property is, but that's all I should have to say. I don't have to write that loop every time. Java should be able to figure out how to do that. It knows what a list is, and you know, if I give it some description of the thing that I want from every dog, that's in the return list, it should be able to do the rest. Okay, so we're gonna walk through how to do this in a series of steps that become more and more fun as we go along. So here's our starting point. I'm gonna write a, a function, okay? <coughs> so this seems like something that, you know, again, I've identified that um, filtering this list of dogs is a common enough operation that I'd like it to be able to be something that I do uh, as a function, right? So I'm gonna take it out of my code, and I'm gonna, you know, rather than having to write this loop over and over again, I'll just write the loop once, okay? So essentially, this is the skeleton of my code, but there's two things that are missing here, right? So I, I you know, essentially, this is kind of what I just did, right, just wrapped into a function. So I create a list of dogs, and then I have a loop. I go through my original list, and there's two things that I need to be able to provide to this uh, function that I'm not be able to provide already. So I pass in the list of dogs, right? And then I need some way to describe what I want. So I'm referred to this as the filter specification because inside the loop, I need to be able to actually apply that to every dog object. So these are the two things I need. 
I need some way to describe what I want in a way that I can pass it to this function, okay? So, there are languages, many of them in fact, including uh, most of the new ones, that support something called first class functions. What is a first class function? So a first class function essentially means that a function is a first class citizen in the language. It can be stored in a variable. It can be passed to another function as an argument, okay? So this feature makes this type of code extremely easy to write, okay? So here's an example. Here's a filter dogs function that takes two arguments. It takes dogs and a filter. It goes through everything in the dogs and essentially it takes, so this is a function, okay? Interesting, we've never seen this before in Java. This argument is a function. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call this function, I'm gonna pass it the dog. And all the function has to do is return true or false. If it returns true, I stick the dog in the list. If not, I don't, okay? And down at the bottom, I have an example of calling this, okay? So I'm gonna call filter dogs, I'm gonna pass it a list, an existing list of dogs, and then here's my function. So I'm passing it a function that essentially returns true if the dog's age is greater than 10. What's the problem with this code? From, from our perspective, something seriously wrong with this. Yeah. Oh, okay, somebody's noticed something about this. Well, there's, there's, that's, that's just a hint of the pro actual problem, right? What's the, what's the problem with this code? I mean, if I, if I put this code on, on the exam and said, what's the output, what would, you, what, what would be a valid response? This is not so non-obvious that nobody should be able to get this. Yeah. Is this Java? I like that question. What do you guys think? Is this Java? No. This is JavaScript. Okay, so this isn't even Java. That's not how you declare a function in Java? You've never seen a function keyword before? That's JavaScript, right? Do you see any types anywhere? No. Right? This is, this is JavaScript code, okay? So why am I showing you JavaScript? Because Java doesn't support first class functions. Uh oh. So Java is an old language. This was a feature that was not part of the language when it was created, um, and Java does not support this feature. So if you were writing this in Python, you'd be all set. If you're writing JavaScript, you'd be all set. Um, a variety of other languages, I think even like C++ now supports some version of this. Java does not. Okay, so let's back up and see if we can solve the problem a different way. So essentially, what do I want here? The argument to filter dogs. So, so filter dogs as a function needs some guarantee about what it can do with this uh, argument. It needs to guarantee, for example, that that argument supports a certain function, right? Okay, that's really what I need because I'm gonna call that function in here. Right, so we're gonna agree that there's a function called test or include or something like that. And then I'm gonna call it, I'm gonna pass it a dog. And if the result is true, I'm gonna put the dog in the list. And if the result is false, I'm not. But I still want different classes to be able to implement this differently. So, can anyone tell me where we've seen something like this? Yeah. Oh no, let's get there slowly. Someone is like 10 slides ahead of us. We have seen this already. Actually, that's true. You guys have seen these because you had to use Android. Oh, well. Um, but we've seen these in class. We've taught you this, right? There was a, a specific feature of Java that allows a class to declare that it provides some set of functions, right? How do I do that in Java? If I want a class to be able to say, I support this particular function, and here's the signature, I do that how? Yeah, we've done this using interfaces. So here's an example of, of the code. Now we're kind of moving in the direction of a solution. So now I've created an interface called dog filter. If I implement dog filter, I have to provide one function. It's called include. It returns a Boolean and it takes a dog as an argument. So now my filter function can take anything that implements dog filter and it can call include on it on line seven. 
So essentially, I know that anything that's passed to this function, the compiler will guarantee that anything that's passed to this function is an object that I can call include on because it has an include method. I can pass a dog to it because the include method takes a dog, and I can use the result as a Boolean because the include method returns a Boolean, okay? So this is how, this is essentially how we do this in Java. This is Java's um, end run around the fact that it doesn't support first class functions. So anything that we're gonna see later that looks like we're passing a function to a, another function because Java gets pretty close in terms of syntax is actually being treated as an interface internally, okay? So again, filter dogs knows that it can call include because it knows that its dog filter argument implements um, uh, that interface, but we can implement it any way we want, okay? So we can essentially call the same function, filter dogs, with different implementations of this interface to achieve different behavior, okay? So let's do this. Um, so here I'm gonna provide, so I've got my inter dog filter interface. I'm gonna call, I'm gonna create an age filter class. Um, I'll save the age locally and I'll create a constructor so that I can pass in an age, okay? And now, oh sorry, I need to implement the interface, so I'm gonna implement dog filter implements. So now I've gotta provide this um, function, include, takes a dog, and this is an age filter. So I'm gonna say return dog.get age is equal to age. That's it. So when I create an instance of this filter, I tell it what age to use, and then the include function simply returns true if the dog has that age. Pretty simple, okay? So let's see if we can get this to work. All right, so let's do this. Let's print um, dogs. So I've gotta call my filter dogs function. I'm gonna pass it my original list of dogs, and now I'm gonna pass it a new instance of my age filter, and I'll filter for dogs that are 14. Okay, that worked pretty well, all right? So then, again, the nice thing about my age filter is that I can, um, it's, it's flexible because it takes this argument, so I can essentially filter for dogs that are 13, I can filter for dogs that are three, I can filter for dogs that are zero. I can empty out, okay? Okay, so, we're doing good. We're getting, we're getting somewhere, kind of, right? We're, we're making some progress here in the sense that now I have a, a, a flexible function, and if I wanted to, I'm not going to in the interest of time, but I could implement another, um, I could say public class, I gotta be able to spell it uh, birthday filter, I could have that implement dog filter, and this one I could have it filter based on birthday, okay? So this is, this is nice, except it's still sort of messy. Right? Every different filter, I've gotta have like a new class to support it, right? Which isn't necessarily what I want. So, now, let's introduce a little piece of Java syntax. That, again, you might have seen when you've been working on Android, but we haven't talked about it in class before. So this is something called an anonymous class, all right? This down here is, is new syntax, okay? So essentially what I'm doing here on line five is I'm saying, I want, an, I want an object that implements dog filter, I'm gonna call it birthday filter. I use new to create an interface, which normally I'm not allowed to do, except for what follows new is an implementation of the interface. So within these curly brackets, I'm actually both declaring what the class is going to do and creating a new instance of it in one fell swoop. So I can do this in Java. And again, you guys might have seen this when you've been working on Android. Um, so now the nice thing is I have, a, I have a reference to this called birthday filter, and I can use that. I can pass that to that filter dogs function. The reason why these are called anonymous classes is because this class has no name. You'll notice that I used new dog filter, but dog filter isn't even, a, isn't even an object type. It's an interface. I can't create, I can't use new to create an interface. So this is an object that implements dog filter, 
That's why I can store it in a reference variable of type dog filter, but it doesn't have a name. So if I wanted to create another instance of this, there's no way to do it, right? If I can't use new uh, birthday filter, right? Because there's no birthday filter class that's been declared in. All right, so, so again, this is a convenient uh, syntax if I want to use a class once, and I can, I can both implement an interface and I can also extend an existing class. So here's another valid use of an anonymous class. Here, I have a, a dog class that has a two-string method, and then I create a sweet old dog that is an instance, it's something that extends dog and overrides two string. I can add other methods here as well if I want to, right? So this is a new way to create a new type of Java class without having to have a class definition somewhere. That's another way to think about it. Okay, so I can use this to further simplify my code. Because before what I didn't like is that every time I wanted a new filter, I had to create a new class. Now I don't have to do that. So let's look at how I'm gonna, I'm gonna write this code now. So in, inside my main function, I'm gonna say I want a dog filter, birthday filter is equal to new dog filter. And now I've gotta implement my include method. Is it called include? Yeah, okay, dog, dog, and I'll say, um, return dog.getBirthday is equal to 100, all right? So now I've got my dog filter, uh, now I've got my birthday filter class that implements this interface stored in a variable. And so now I can pass it to the filter dog, the filter dogs function. Uh, what is that called again? Filter dogs. Dogs, birthday filter. It works, cool, okay? So, so again, the nice thing about this is, like I don't, there's no class definition for this birthday filter. It's just part of, it's like a variable, it's part of my code. So if I decided, oh, I want, you know, to uh, do something where like it's a range of birthdays, so let's say get birthday is greater than zero, or dog dot get birthday is less than, well, let's make this 50, is less than 100, right? Now everybody's in there, right? So I can essentially, modify this without exposing a class definition that, that I don't need. Okay, so now, getting even closer. I really like that you guys have seen this syntax before on Android because it makes it easier to talk about. So this is still, so again, let's go back and look at this. And what we like about it is it works and it's flexible. What we don't like about it is it's a lot of syntax, right? Um, so is there a way to kind of keep pushing back against some of this unnecessary syntax. And there is, and this is something that Java already supports. It's called a lambda expression. So if, in this case, I have this, uh, an interface dog filter, this code, where I'm creating a new anonymous class, and I'm providing an implementation of this function, is equivalent, it's the same as this, okay? So again, this is a little bit of new syntax. So I have my reference variable uh, of type dog filter named birthday filter. And here, this is what's called an, a lambda expression in Java. This says that the one function that I need to provide as part of this interface takes a local variable called dog and returns dog.getBirthday is equal to 100. That's all I have to provide. One of the things that makes this work is if the interface only has one method, okay? But actually, let me pause to talk about lambda functions. So lambda functions, this, um, this terminology, in Python they're called lambdas, here they're called lambdas, this actually has really deep roots, and I'm not gonna talk about this very much, um, but there are, uh, the word lambda and the use in this particular context goes back to groundbreaking theoretical work by a mathematician named, named Alonzo Church, who did work on formalizing a model of computation. In our context, a lambda function is a anonymous function. So remember we just had anonymous classes? An anonymous function is a function that has no name. There's no way to call it after I've declared it. It has no name within the scope of the function that's running. It's just now saved in a variable, right? Um, 
So again, this is something that goes back to formal models of computation that people developed to be able to prove things about these types of systems. And many languages have this keyword or this feature. So uh, Python actually uses the Lambda keyword to declare an anonymous function. All right. So here's how we get to first class functions in Java. This was a long journey, but we're, we're getting kind of, we're getting toward the end, right? So essentially in Java, what we do to approximate, so here's where we arrived. And this is really nice. This is great, like very clean syntax, right? Um, so as long as I have an interface that, imp that has the function, the, sorry, that has the class implement one method, then I can create an anonymous implementation of that interface using this lambda function syntax that consists of declarations of the variables, what I'm gonna call the variables in my function inside parentheses followed by this arrow notation and then the implementation of the function. If the function's more complicated than one line, you can add braces and you can write something that looks more like a traditional method body. So, and again, let me point out this important feature of functional interfaces. A functional interface in Java can only provide one method. And this sort of makes sense, right? Because if this provided two methods, how would this work? Like the syntax would suddenly get very weird, right? Um, I wanna be able to tell exactly how this particular implementation of dog filter is supposed to work. If dog filter has 10 different functions and I have to provide an implementation for all 10 of them, that's gonna get pretty gross, okay? And so, so functional interfaces, interfaces have only one method, and then this new lambda expression syntax that I think appeared in Java 8, but has been um, cleaned up a little bit in subsequent versions of Java. So now I can essentially provide an implementation of an anonymous, uh, of a, sorry, a functional interface using this very nice syntax. All right, so let's see this. Well, I mean, here's how it looks in practice, right? I just cut right to the chase here, right? So I've got my same list. I have my filter dogs function. And now I don't have to declare a temporary variable. I don't have to, you know, do anything. Uh, I don't have to have a five line thing that's mainly, you know, a class definition sort of uh, garbage. Instead, I tell exactly what I want. This is what we wanted the whole time. We essentially wanted a way to filter this list of dogs in a flexible way based on any sort of property, right? So I can say if their birthday is equal to 100, I can say if their age is equal to 13 or greater than 13, right? I can put anything I want in here. So I'm, I'm you know, I, I started with the loop and I've gotten to the point where I am now very close to just being able to tell Java how, which dogs I want, essentially. Got all these dogs in a list, here's the dogs I want. I want dogs that have an age greater than 13. Right, this is extremely powerful. So, a higher order function, um, so essentially what we've written here in filter dogs is an example of something that's referred to as a higher order function. Why is it a higher order function? It's, it's a function that takes a function as an argument and uses it in some way. So it's a function that partially acts on other functions. The way we accomplish this in Java is by using uh, functional interfaces, but that, that sort of doesn't really matter, right? This is very similar to what you see in other languages, right? That JavaScript example we saw before. So dog filter is essentially a function that I'm using to determine whether or not the dog belongs in the list. Okay? And this, func this function filter dogs is now a higher order function, right? Because dog filter is a functional interface. Now let's, so one of the things, so we've sort of accomplished half of our goal at this point. Half of our goal was to figure out, and I've got, you know, 10 minutes left, right? So half of our goal was to figure out um, how to tell Java what dogs we wanted, right? All I want to provide is a description of exactly what I want in the list. The other uh, thing we wanted was we thought that there, would, there, there was like a common language of some of these operations. For example, it's very common when you're working with data to say, you know, for example, take all the list of students in the class and filter on people that were in class on Wednesday, right? That's something that you might, you might want to do if you were processing some data of a certain type. So it turns out that there's a whole library of these higher order functions that are common across many different languages. Filter, again, 
take a list, run some test on it that I'm gonna provide through a lambda expression, and only give me back ones that pass, right, where that returns true. Map, this is another one, right? Apply some transformation. So for example, I might wanna take every dog and, you know, uh, produce a string that's a combination of the dog's name and age, right? That's an example of a map, right? Or replace, so, or add some field to each dog based on the data that's already there. And I can also write loops based on this construct. So for each is an example of a higher order function that essentially takes every item in a list and passes it to another function, and that function gets to do something, like print it or whatever, okay? So these are, these are extremely common across lots and lots and lots of different types of applications in Java. And so rather than providing, so that we have these two pieces of code that we would really like to get rid of. One is this dog filter, and the second is this filter dogs function, because we kind of feel like that's so common that I should be able to uh, use somebody else's implementation. So much have already provided that, right? So, so it turns out, first of all, we don't need this additional dog filter interface because Java already has built into it an, an interface that's called predicate. And predicate represents a function that returns a Boolean. It takes one argument and returns a Boolean, okay? So we can, we can get rid of our filter function and use this. Um, and the second thing we wanna get rid of is this filter dogs function itself, right? Because again, like this just seems really common. Take a bunch of objects take a higher order, you know, take a, um, a filtering function and return objects that pass the filter. Um, and so we don't need this either. Instead, the list, Java's built-in list classes already provide this type of thing. So for example, here's, this is an actual part of the list interface. It's a function called remove if. Remove if takes a predicate as an argument and removes anything in this list that matches the predicate. So we can come back here, we have our list, right? We can essentially say dogs.remove if, now I have to pass it a higher order function, and I'm gonna return dog.get age is not equal to 14. Let's see, is that gonna, see if that works, and then I'm gonna print the list. So, so this doesn't actually this modifies the original list. So now, that's it. Right? That one function essentially did all that work. There's no extra interface, there's no filter dogs function. I'm just reusing existing functionality that's already part of Java. Okay, I'm almost done. So, so essentially what we've been doing today is exploring this, this um, Java support for something called functional program, right? And I just wanna bring us back and sort of look at some of the things that we've seen today. So functional programming um, you know, emphasizes as a style. There are languages that are purely functional, and those languages have rules that you may find very frustrating when you start to use them, but turn out to be actually quite powerful. What I'm talking about is functional programming as a style, not as a set of rules. You can program functional code in Python, in JavaScript, in Java, in Go, in C++. You can also write imperative or object-oriented or recursive code in those languages. Right, so this is a style. When we're writing functional code, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take a problem, and instead of writing a bunch of how-to code, typically that has a bunch of loops in it and conditional statements, we try to use functions to do the work. So we try to take some data and compose functions to achieve some result that we want, okay? That leads to code that is inherently declarative because those functions are typically telling Java or another language how to do something or what we want to accomplish. Here's an object, here's how to transform it, transform all the objects in this list. Here's a list of objects, here's the objects I want, you know, give me a list back with only those objects. Here's a list of objects, here's a function I want to run that, that um, runs some operation over the entire list, like sum, for example, compute that form. And a lot of times what we do is we use these re reusable uh, building blocks to build these operations, okay? So Java, you know, Java is not a perfect carrier of this particular uh, programming idea. It supports some ideas from functional programming very well, some very poorly. So pure, uh, pure functional programming emphasizes the use of what's called pure functions. A pure function has output that is only 
a function of its inputs. And this is very, very difficult to square with object-oriented programming, okay? If you really want to, you know, give your brain, you know, some exercise over the summer, try to learn a fully functional language, right? Or a strict, very opinionated functional language like Haskell or OCaml. Trust me, this is hard. You will feel lost a lot. You will be like, I thought I learned a program. I took this worthless class. And at the end, he was like, oh, you know how to program. And then I tried to learn Haskell. And I was like, I feel like I'm starting over. And you, you are on some level because it's so different. But when you're done, you know a lot more, right? And you can use the things you learn using these languages to enrich your practices of computer science. All right. Last but not least, just let me sort of show you a little bit, dangle something in front of you as a little bit of a, a, a taste. This is actually something we're going to do a small homework problem on. But this is sort of how things can look in the future. Okay, so Java has a way to represent a series of operations on a list using something called a string. So here is code that does the following things. Given a list of dogs, it only, it removes any dog that has age over 10. Then it grabs all the names of the dogs, converts them to uppercase, sorts them, and then prints them. Imagine how much imperative code you would have to write to do the same thing. You guys know how to do this. If I gave you this as a homework problem, you would nail it. It's not hard. But this would be like 30 lines, fine lines. And it tells you exactly what it's doing, right? And it works. Well, if I can get the, the example run. Yeah, there we go. Right? So if I say, let's look for dogs whose age is greater than 10, there you go. Right, so, so this is, again, this is, I'm, I'm trying to point the way forward to give you a sense that there is more here. There's more to learn. Um, you know, this, this code to me looks awesome, you know, but I've been doing this for a while, and so maybe I've developed some appreciation for compactness. But to me, I would much rather write this than the 40 lines of loops and imperative code it would require to achieve the same thing. It's also much, much easier to modify, right? I mean, you, you saw me just in, you know, two keystrokes change change this to do something different. Okay. So, so again, you know, to contrast with declarative programming, um, in declarative programming, it, I can, I'm telling Java exactly what to do. Okay, so, overall lesson at this point in the semester, um, there's more out there, right? And again, don't be afraid if you find stuff that feels uncomfortable. Um, that feeling is good, and it's frequently a feeling that accompanies looking at something that's more powerful that's actually going to turn you to unlock things that are new and turn you into a better computer scientist and train you in a whole new way of thinking about stuff. Okay, so I don't have, t I'll come back to the slide in a second. Let me go through some details about the final project very quickly. So this is on Thursday. Um, it's worth 1% extra credit. In the morning, you're gonna receive an email telling you what room to report to. This is because we have a couple rooms and spaces set aside for the projects that are considered to be the most impressive and we're doing judging on Tuesday and Wednesday. Around 12.45, you guys should be setting up in your assigned rooms. We're gonna do uh, demos and judging from one to three. Um, we'll have some judges drawn from the course staff and maybe from outside who will be coming around, evaluating your projects, asking some questions, taking notes, and we'll use that to, to determine the winners. So on Friday at 1.30, we're gonna do uh, prizes. We actually do have prizes for the fair, as well as some other awards that we'll give out as well. Um, right here, uh, that'll take maybe half an hour. Uh, it's not gonna be a, a long thing. Okay, on Wednesday, we're gonna do, so there's two things we do on Wednesday. The first thing is, we're gonna talk about everything you guys did this semester, and this is a lot of fun, because you did a lot. Um, so we're gonna do a little bit of this. Uh, we have a lot of data about what the class does, and so it's fun to look at. And then we're gonna do the ISIS form. Please come on Wednesday to do the ISIS forms. I will tell you several stories about how we use your feedback and how that feedback has led to several real big changes to the class over the last couple of semesters. So we really need that. Come on Wednesday to do that. I will see you then. I can stick around for a couple of minutes if people have questions on functional programming. Otherwise, I will see you on Wednesday. If you haven't taken the exam yet, good luck. Um, and good luck with finishing up your final products. <laughs>